Hello again, rail fans. In this episode, I'm answering a viewer question from Doug Rogers of Austell, Georgia. Doug writes, who controls railroad diamonds? How are diamond crossings handled? Do the different dispatchers coordinate with each other? Is there a third party that handles permissions to cross? Well, just like a lot of these questions I get, I quickly discovered what I don't know about the subject, which was most of this stuff. So I had to investigate old timetables and rule books. I also had to reach out to experts who deal or dealt with this stuff every single day on the job. Fortunately for me, I know a few retired train dispatchers. I contacted them and they were very helpful on the subject. Actually, I couldn't have done it without them. So I've learned a lot while preparing for this video. So let's go. During America's railroad boom in the 1800s, they often found their routes crossed other rail lines. When they reached an intersecting point, they only had a few options. Fly over on a bridge, go under through a tunnel, or cross the other track at grade, which is engineering talk for go flat across the other line using a device called a diamond or a level crossing. That's what's happening here at TN Tower in Tampa. Train 0700 on the X Seaboard Airline Main to Brooksville has gotten permission to cross the X ACL Main going north. Railroad crossings at grade can be one of the most dangerous maneuvers on the railroad. The possibility of a major accident at Diamonds is why there are strict rules on what train crews can do when crossing there. At Mulberry, Florida, train 0730, a Bone Valley local, has gotten permission from the CSX dispatcher to cross the SAL Main, the Valrico sub. The train is on former Atlantic coastline trackage. It's crossing former seaboard airline trackage. Before 1967, these were two separate railroad companies. From what I could glean from timetables of the era, the crossing was controlled by ACL, as it was normally clear for that side. SAL trains had to pull up, call an operator for permission to cross, then move derails on either side of the diamond on their track, move across, and then reset the derails. Today it's all one company, so when a train crew gets authority to travel a route on either subdivision, they'll get clearance to cross the diamond. Over the past 10 years, CSX has been installing these OWLS-type diamonds at certain locations. OWLS is the acronym for one-way low speed, designed for use at crossings where one line sees far less traffic than the other line. On the less busy track, wheels ride up on their flanges and over the rail of the busier line. This prevents the wheel banging that makes so much noise and naturally tears diamond structures apart. The Valrico subdivision was traditionally for decades the busiest line in the Bone Valley. There are essentially two types of railroad crossings at grade, interlockings and non-interlockings. An interlocking is defined as an arrangement of interconnected signals and signal appliances for which interlocking rules are in effect. Signal and movement of signal appliances must succeed each other in proper sequence. In plain language, the interlocking diamond and any connecting Y-tracks in the crossing plant are all linked to the signals protecting them. An operator cannot move or change any of them until he does so in an exact order. And there are two types of interlockings, dispatcher controlled, also called remotely controlled, and automatic. At a dispatcher controlled interlocking, the dispatcher or operator fully controls the signals over the locking, the whole show. Trains needing to cross at his diamond have to contact him either when obtaining authority on their whole route or specifically before they're approaching the crossing. If both railroads on the diamond are owned by one railroad, as here at Plant City, no problem. One dispatcher to deal with. In the days before automatic interlockings, operators in offices called towers sat in charge of railroad crossings. Inside the tower, large levers connected to signals by trackside rods allowed the operator to give permission to trains to cross the diamond safely. This operator was employed by one of the railroads or sometimes both of them involved in the crossing. Sometimes it was which railroad got there first, other times it was selected by mutual agreement. 
This tower was likely right next to the rails when it was in operation. It was moved back when it was preserved for the museum here. At Crawford, Florida, the CSX Callahan subdivision crosses the Norfolk Southern Valdosta District. This is southbound train 175 approaching the Diamond, bound for NS Simpson Yard in Jacksonville. Here we have two separate railroad companies crossing one another. Crawford is an automatic interlocking, meaning first come, first served. While the respective dispatchers have control of their own lines and see the diamond signal status on their screens, the Crawford interlocking mechanism will accept the request of the train that's first in the circuit and begin a countdown of a predetermined length of time. Say it's 6 minutes and 32 seconds here, just for argument's sake. From the time he enters the circuit with a clear signal, he'll have 6 minutes and 32 seconds to get his train onto that diamond or time runs out and signals go back to red. It's a safety mechanism that would give any opposing train time to get stopped in case of a conflict. Crews can also request clearance to cross the diamond manually. On the signal box near the tracks, there's a control switch under lock and key. A crew member can open it, push a button, and that sends a request to the system to start running time toward a clear signal across. If they get a green or yellow signal, they go. At Plant City, Florida is an interlocking that's remotely controlled as opposed to automatic. This is the ex-Atlantic Coastline A-Line crossing the ex-Seaboard Airline S-Line. But this has all been the same company since the 1967 merger of the two railroads. Since the lines are all the same company, CSX, and under the same dispatcher, there's no discussion needed about who goes first and which line has priority. The CSX JF dispatcher makes all those decisions from his or her desk in Jacksonville. It's late on a July Saturday afternoon and the JF dispatcher has cleared the way for Amtrak 92, the northbound Silver Star. When 92's route was set up earlier this afternoon, everything else of this diamond was locked out by means of red signals. As the star clears the diamond, circuits start clearing up for the next train the dispatcher has stacked in the parade tonight. Ten minutes later, it's L778, daily rock shuttle from Tampa to Winston Yard. He's running on the same A-line as 92, but not going as far. Watch the wheels of the rock hoppers slamming this diamond. The initial assault on the crossing begins with two 400,000 pound locomotives. There's a second diamond in this interlocking on which the Plant City subdivision breaks out of the S-Line and runs south to the Bone Valley Phosphate area. The control method, though, is the same. After that, 50 minutes passes. A northbound signal on the S-Line goes high green. When he gets here, we discover it's an empty ethanol train returning to Chicago. There are no moving parts in the typical diamond. They are four-sided structures built with channels to allow wheel flanges to pass through in any direction. That small gap is responsible for all that hammering and all of the noise that creates. That hammering in turn creates maintenance issues that require diamonds to be replaced at closer intervals than normal track. While preparing for this video, something I found really interesting is the geometry of diamonds. While most of them look like square boxes, they rarely have perfect 90-degree angles. 
This is the interlocking at Valdosta, Georgia. Here, the CSX Bowline crosses the Norfolk Southern Macon District. Looking from the air, that diamond isn't even close to being square, and that's just the way it is. Railroads had to approach these crossings on their own right-of-way, and it was almost never at a perfect right angle. Valdosta is another fully automatic interlocking. Even more interesting is the interlocking at Cordille, Georgia. You have three railroads crossing here, and one of them has a siding going through the plant. The XACL, now CSX Fitzgerald Sub, crosses the X Southern, now NS Macon District, and its Cordille siding at a fairly normal angle. But then there's the X Seaboard, now Heart of Georgia Short Line. In order to make this crossing, they had to come into Cordille at a pretty shallow angle, first across the coastline, then across the southern. In the early decades, it's likely this major junction was controlled by an operator right here at Cordill. Probably either the southern or the seaboard control the interlocking since those two got here before the ACL predecessor arrived in 1902. Now Cordill is all automatic, first come, first serve, for CSX and NS, but the heart of Georgia has to manually request to cross. That could be because it's an unsignaled line and may not have the circuitry to participate in the automatic system. The diamond at Tampa's 14th Street crossing gives us a close-up look at a typical diamond, but one that sees more traffic on the shorter local line than on the Class 1 railroad it crosses. This is near the southernmost point on the CSX A line. Here on the eastern side of downtown Tampa, the Tico streetcar line crosses. The diamond is fully automatic and unusual because, like Valdosta, it's a signaled interlocking in dark territory. CTC signal operation on the A line ends a mile north of here at TN Tower. But when Tampa built this electric streetcar line in the early 2000s, CSX demanded they install a protected crossing. So this automatically controlled diamond has served ever since. Whoever gets here first, streetcar, passenger train, or local freight train, gets the signal first. All right, train number 91, we're about to knock down that 14th street clear signal, and we're still clear 12 cars to the first switch. Amtrak 91 is backing into Tampa Union Station and has the clear signal to cross. And less than a minute after Amtrak clears the circuit, the streetcar gets the green to cross, all automatic. The Tico line has a curvy approach on both sides of the crossing. Crazy, radical curves mean you could never run a conventional train car down it, just in case you were wondering. When I was shooting the Plant City and Bone Valley parts of this video, I went to a spot north of Lakeland that local rail fan Josh Kentner recommended to me. Granger's Barbecue and Steakhouse. 
my kind of place for what it does not have. No paved parking lot with tiny spaces for compact cars. Just a graded dirt park where you want area. No credit cards, tap to pay, or identity theft is going to happen here either. Cash only. And no automatic barbecue machine with digital recipe control. Just a fireplace with real wood smoke. I doubt the vintage signs were bought at a vintage sign dealer either. That Coke sign has probably been rusting in that spot for 30 years. I got it to go and ate it in the truck so I could keep an ear on the radio. The barbecue was smoky and authentic. Enough sliced pork for two people and pretty good sauce. The sides were actually my favorite. I don't know what they put in the coleslaw or the beans, but they're both incredible. I might just get those the next time I'm here. Around 12.50 for this barbecue lunch at Granger's on North US 98 in Lakeland. Now in preparing for this video, my thanks to retired CSX dispatcher Gordon Deason. He told me some insights on this whole situation, this whole area of the rules uh, that I just I couldn't have done it without him and some other folks who were still on the job who helped me to understand this unique aspect of railroading. Now I know a lot of you are saying, well that's not the way it's done on my railroad or in my territory or, or up where I live and I understand that. There are just uh, seem like an infinite number of different ways to handle railroad crossings at grade. I couldn't cover them all on this first go around, so I think I'll have to do a part two on Diamond somewhere down the line, so cut me some slack on that, please. Uh, a thank you also to Ira Schwanitz of Missouri. He sent me that purple derail sign, which um, is a beautiful uh, specimen. Um, Union Pacific puts those signs uh, next to their derails to identify them uh, easily so you can spot them easily when you're coming up on one uh, and that's very cool. Uh, first I thought it was a distance signal uh, marker but it's not. It's a derail uh, sign. The purple identifies it as that and I love purple stuff. Um, so thank you Irish Schwanitz. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't already done that. Write your comments in the comments section down below. I read them all and I try to reply to as many as I can. And let's plan to meet up again somewhere soon, somewhere out there on the high iron. And until we do, this is Danny Harmon, out.